everybody for coming in the room and on Zoom. My name is uh, Dr. Steve Osofsky. I'm director of the Cornell K. Lee C. Yang Center for Wildlife Health and a professor here at the Veterinary College. And we're thrilled that uh, folks are joining us for this presentation this evening. I'm just going to take a few minutes before I introduce our speaker to tell those of you who don't know us a little bit about our center. We um, have a vision of a healthy future for wildlife, people, and planet. And our mission is transforming science into impact through discovery, education, engagement, and policy to ensure a healthy future for wildlife and for the environment that supports us all. Why do we do this? It's because we need nature, and now nature needs us. And what I mean by that is we need nature for all the critical things it gives us from food, clean air, clean water, climate mitigation -ish, uh, services, carbon sequestration, things like that, things that we often take for granted. And nature needs us. People say nature doesn't need us. It's fine. Nature needs us to be better stewards, to be more mindful of our relationship with wild nature. The work we do falls into four basic pillars. And we have programs around the world where we as wildlife health professionals, both in terrestrial and aquatic systems, respond to the health threats, to the survival of key species and populations. Many of us work around the world providing landscape level guidance to governments on wildlife compatible land use policies and practices. We work very importantly to minimize the transfer of diseases between wildlife, livestock, and people. And you don't need to look very far to see these issues arising every day. Who would have thought we would have seen avian influenza now breaking out in dairy cattle. And all of the things that we do often roll up into that last pillar, which is building new constituencies for wildlife conservation. You know, for many governments, for many people, conservation is sort of esoteric. It's a bit of a luxury. But what, one of the things we try and do is demonstrate how conservation of coral reefs, savannas, forests, and other systems actually can be good and important for delivering public health dividends, agriculture, dividends. So these sectors are all interlinked. If you want to learn more about us, you can go to that QR code. And uh, if you go to wildlife.cornell.edu, that's our website, you can sign up for our quarterly newsletter. Um, we welcome sharing information with both the scientific and lay public. So please join us. Um, it's an exciting time. And we really want to help people rethink their relationship, as I said, with the natural world. So I'm now going to introduce our esteemed guests this evening. I'm very honored to be introducing Brett Blumenthal. And I'm going to read this without my glasses, because I didn't memorize it. But Brett is uh, the quintessential Renaissance woman whose career has spanned architecture, management consulting, strategic design, authorship in both the wellness and children's genres, and most recently, wildlife and landscape art. As an artist, Brett is committed to using her work to express the beauty of nature to future generations, and her success to, is used to advance wildlife conservation. One of the many ways Brett has expressed this commitment is by noting 10%, donating 10% of all proceeds she has made from her over 40,000 art sales to date. To launch her art-based career, Brett started Tiny Toes Design in 2013, selling online through Etsy, Amazon, and her own online store. Today, Brett's artwork is sold in over 30 countries and through popular retail outlets, including Land of Nod, Pottery Barn Kids, San Diego Zoo, and the National Park Service. In addition to her professional work, Brett is an associate member of Artists for Conservation, the world's leading artist group focused on supporting environmental initiatives. She's also acting vice chair of the board of Stand for Animals, a nonprofit in Charlotte, North Carolina, providing low cost spay and neuter and veterinary services to the underserved community there. Brett is proudly double red, having received her Bachelor of Architecture from Cornell's College of Art, Architecture and Planning, and her MBA from Cornell's Johnson School. She lives in Charlotte, North Carolina with her husband, son, and two fur babies, Dakota, a rescued mixed breed pup, and Da Vinci, a gray and orange tabby. So Brett has uh, become part of our Wildlife Health Center family, and I'm thrilled to have her join us now. Brett. Can you hear me? Am I live? <laughs> 
Thank you, Steve, and thank you to the College of Veterinary Medicine and the Center for Wildlife Health for hosting this. I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, I think I need the clicker, I just realized. And um, with that, let's get started. Oh, also thank you for being here, both virtually and in person. So we are at a crucial time in the history of our planet. There is no denying that we are bombarded by headlines that paint kind of a bleak picture for the future of our planet and for wildlife. But I'm not here today to talk about statistics or science of these headlines. I'm here to talk about how we communicate about the issues that surround these headlines and what we can do better to engage the masses and cultivate a an, an culture of change. So we're not playing a long game anymore. We need to instill a sense of urgency. And yet when we talk about these issues, a lot of it can fall flat. The whole doomsday approach, the earth is on fire, uh, six mass extinction, these are true potentially, but also can be very alienating to people. Uh, people can feel hopeless, they can feel overwhelmed, and this can lead to apathy and indifference. So we really need to do better. Humans are highly emotional. It turns out we have our decision-making processes are around 70 to 95% based on emotional factors. And yet, we tend to use rational arguments to help people understand these issues. So instead, we need to find a way to communicate that engages people and fosters them to have, fosters a connection for them to have to the issues and hopefully eventually inspires them to take action. Art is where this comes, this is where art comes in and art has the real power to transform, inspire, educate and motivate people to move in a direction that could be transformative. To highlight this, I thought it would be fun to give you a couple different examples of a traditional way that we communicate versus the way an artist might. The Borneo orangutan is um, the largest arboreal mammal. They spend about 90% of their time in the treetops. And uh, yet, over the last 20%, or 20 years, we have seen an 80% decline in their habitat due to conflict palm oil and timber harvesting. And we also know, due to this, we have seen a 50% decline in their population over the last 60 years. These are the facts. This is science. This is how we normally communicate. And as scientists, a lot of people can understand this, but as a mass, pers uh, mass population person, uh, this can fall flat. So how does an artist potentially talk about the issues? In Ophelia Redpath's Sorry, she depicts a human and how they might feel about the fact that there is total devastation to this bewildered, beautiful creature. And yet, on the other side, she depicts the orangutan who, although they've lost their home, and although they really are endangered because of human actions, is incapable of blame. Her ability to convey the same message in a visual piece can be really highly provocative. And it draws a person in, engages them, and potentially wants, gets them to want to learn more about the situation. And so she, <laughs> the way she has structured this may or may not be appealing to you, but you cannot deny the fact that it's really, it's really thought provoking. It might make you feel sad, it might make you feel angry, and it might even make you want to learn more about the situation. But even what's more, somebody who sees this and really gets to understand the problem might be inspired to change or make, take an action. Maybe they want to donate to orangutan conservation. Maybe they want to donate to reforestation. Or maybe they look at products to see if there's the palm oil ingredient that they usually don't, that they don't want in their products anymore. 
I want to highlight another example, uh, polar bears and sea ice. As we know, polar bears are highly reliant on sea ice for survival. They use it for protective cover, and they use it to hunt. And yet, as the sea ice melts and they have less of it, they have to rely on their fat stores for longer periods of time to survive because they are unable to hunt. And the longer they have to rely on them, the longer or the higher the probability they may starve. Yet, we do know over the last 30 years that 95% of the oldest and thickest sea ice has vanished. And unfortunately, we know that when it comes to the Northeast Alaskan and Northwest uh, Canadian Territory subspecies of polar bear, there has been a 40% decline in that population as a result in just a 10-year span. Again, facts, data, and science. So I am really passionate about marine conservation, and so I took a stab at this myself, and I'd like to share with you what I came up with. So this is kind of a sketch and in preliminary form, but um, I wanted to really highlight how the disintegration of sea ice really means a disintegration of the polar bear species. And again, with the music, potentially, it may have evoked some emotion, an emotional response in you, and hopefully, again, potentially it could make somebody want to take action. So why is art so transformative? Um, I want to just clarify that when I speak about art, I'm not just speaking about painting, but I'm also speaking about things that include sculpture, multimedia, film, and any other sort of creative outlet that expresses something. But the power of art really starts with how it is able to evoke um, an emotional response. Our senses are highly connected to our emotions. When we take in the world through our senses, it tells our brain how to feel. And so because of that, um, that emotional response is a really key factor. Also, we experience art in our own way, and that gives us the ability to be authentic in our response, take the time to sit back and contemplate what we're experiencing. Also, it's deeply personal. How I experience artwork is very different than how somebody else here might experience art. And so we become very deeply connected to the issue in our own way. It's also, it has a strong power without any words to send a message to anybody around the world. So it transcends barriers of culture, of language, of socioeconomic status, religion, and even generations. And as a result, it doesn't matter who you are, but art can speak to you in the same way it might speak to somebody else. Also, when we think about wildlife, a lot of it is in places we will never go. So I can't see a polar bear today, and I may never, unfortunately, see a polar bear in my life. But art has the power to bring the inaccessible to us. So wild places and wild species become much more accessible through art. Also, because there's no verbal reliance um, on what we're seeing, we are able to come and be engaged with art and have a more open mind. While words can inflame and can potentially create a defensive response, Art tends to engage and draw people in. And finally, it transcends time and space. When you experience art or music today, you're going to have that experience stay with you forever. So it allows you to have an emotional response for as long as time for, on your, for your life um, that you're around. And so all of these things really help ignite change and ignite action. So the next thing I really wanted to discuss was sort of or provide some examples of how people in art are actually using their art to make change and drive impact. 
And there are a lot of different examples um, out there, but I've chosen five that are just very different from each other and I think provide great um, examples for what we're discussing. David Shepard was a wildlife artist uh, for decades. He was very successful, and um, he spent a lot of time in Africa documenting and painting different, piece, different species of wildlife. In 1984, he starred David Shepard Wildlife Foundation because he really wanted to be able to connect his own conservation um, efforts with those conservationists doing great work to help with wildlife survival. And although the organization was originally started mostly on the sales of his own work, in 2008 they started something called Wildlife Artist of the Year. And this engages artists all around the world to create art for wildlife conservation. Last year, they had over 1,400 entries from 760 artists over, from over 60 different um, countries. And I wanted to just provide a quick uh, video, introduce a video to you so that you could see, learn a little bit more about what they do. Obviously, as an organization, wildlife is the heart of what we do but we also were established and set up because of art. DSWF operate in some of the toughest, harshest climates in conservation, and for art to be their language is truly amazing. Currently speaking, there are Global Canvas, Wildlife Artists of the Year, and the Ambassadors programs. So whether you're a professional, an amateur, a child at school, sharing ideas and stories with your, with your peers, there is a space for you at DSWF to, to share those stories and to create your art and your vision. I think it is an artist's duty to, to work tirelessly um, to bring nature's story to the forefront again and share those stories with one another. They're, that's just a snippet of what they do, and I'm gonna kind of have a little bit of a reel here that shows you some of the art that comes through this competition. But since its inception in 2008, they have been able to raise over two million sterling pounds towards wildlife conservation just through these art sales. And that has gone to tremendous work in conservation. And what's so compelling about art sales is that anyone who purchases this art really, um, is, it's a personal connection, obviously, but they find it emotionally um, triggering, it's beautiful, and they can take it away for years to come and enjoy it. But moreover, they know that their purchase is making an impact. So it's a win-win situation where it's a feel-good, they get to have something to cherish, and they have then also been able to somehow make an impact for wildlife conservation. And the finalists that are selected from these uh, competitions, their work is then put onto, um, into an exhibition on the mall galleries in London. And what's really powerful about these uh, exhibitions is that not only does it resonate with somebody like you and me who are already interested in wildlife and conservation, but it also starts dialogues with people who might never have been an environmentalist or wildlife uh, conservationist. And so people come in, they talk to the artists who've created the artwork, they're able to engage them about the issues that they've uh, created about, and the people then walk away with a little more information, a little more insight, potentially wanting more, and maybe a little change. And this really has transformative power because you're now opening minds to people of people who might not have already been interested in this subject. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about their specific impact. They have a three-pronged approach where they fight wildlife crime. They also uh, uh, protect, obviously, endangered species, and they engage communities. And so they've been able to reduce poaching and increase surveillance of um, endangered species throughout uh, Asia and Africa. 
They've increased patrol and law enforcement in areas where bushmeat trade and poaching and animal trafficking, animal trafficking occur and have uh, been able to arrest 31 different significant traffickers in over four countries. Um, they've also are big on instilling values into the next generation where they've designed programs and built facilities to educate children about the importance of conservation. And lastly, they've also diminished um, wildlife human conflict where they have been able to gain trust of communities in Africa and India to then help them diminish wildlife, um, wildlife, hu human wildlife conflict through conservation efforts. The next example I want to talk about is Sea Legacy. Uh, sea Legacy was started by two award-winning conservation photographers, Paul Nicklin and Christina Mittermeier, and Andy Mann, who is an Emmy-nominated uh, director and marine conservationist. And their mission is really to engage the world and have them fall in love with the ocean through highly uh, uh, hopeful, if you will, visual storytelling. And I'd love for you to go on, write this down, sealegacy.org, go onto their website and explore more and go into on their YouTube channel because they have tremendous documentaries and, and footage about all the species that they're working to protect and the work that they do and the exhibitions that they take. But I do want to show a quick trailer of sort of a summary of what they do because I do think it's quite compelling. Oh, oh no. Oh darn. We're going to start again. videos. They're just absolutely stunning. And um, I wanted to just walk you through some of their accomplishments. Obviously, I mentioned that they're really interested in activating sort of this global movement, if you will, around marine conservation. They've also done work like securing over 449,000 square kilometers of land in South Georgia or ocean in South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands where they were able to get the highest protection status for them so that there's no fishing in that area. And they work through something called the Rebuilding Marine Life uh, Recovery Framework where they protect ocean and species. 
They help rehabilitate destroyed habitats. They work to uh, fight pollution and promote and ensure um, sustainable fishing practices. And they believe that the sea and the ocean are a huge, is a huge uh, natural solution to climate change. So recasting the ocean is a, is a solution for that. And finally, working to uh, get equity and justice for coastal communities who are affected by climate change. The next example is Asher J. She is a very cool lady. She um, has a, an approach of many different mediums with her art, but she really likes to sort of evoke an, a visceral response to issues, including wildlife trafficking, poaching, and uh, habitat loss. And so I'm going to show you a quick little animation that she did um, about rhino poaching. like when I stop that, it's a very abrupt stop, sorry. Um, so again, you can see that she really tries to elicit a very visceral emotional response to the, the issues that she's addressing. Her, her impact has really been engaging millions of people through campaigns, uh, huge installations in places like Times Square. She works with organizations on um, campaigns and driving awareness around different issues such as uh, World Wildlife Fund, the African Wildlife Foundation, the American Museum of Natural History and National Geographic, just to name a few. Um, but she, she is kind of just in the, the type of person who likes to put, drive awareness by putting things very much in your face about the reality of the situation. And so she has a very different approach, but um, it is very impactful. Another example I'd like to introduce is John Hyde. And John is really an independent photographer, and his work is through photographic documentation. He lives in, uh, his work is in Alaska and the Pacific Northwest. And much of what he does is sort of bridge the gap between government and uh, conservation. And so he has learned that biology, uh, conservation and politics are highly intertwined and complicated. And so as a result, he has done a lot of work to try to work with both sides to uh, come up with solutions uh, for conservation that work for both sides. Um, and I am going to scroll through some of his imagery here, but some of his accomplishments include with the Tongass National Forest, uh, they were uh, management. They had a management approach that was very consumptive with logging and mining, and he was able to really help uh, transform that mindset to one that's more conservation and recreational uh, in mind. Uh, he also does a lot of photography of uh, wildlife and different species, and he loves all of them, but he is especially drawn to or has had a special encounter with a wolf called Romeo, who uh, maybe you've heard of him, but he was a black wild orphaned wolf in Juneau, Alaska, and he kind of befriended the community. He befriended dogs, humans, and he was a lone wolf. And so he told his story through a photographic essay. And because of that, 
his, the, the story has sort of been revered worldwide, and he has been able to change a lot of mindsets about the importance of species like wolves, where they are really important parts of the ecosystem and need to be protected and conserved. He's also really been proud of the fact that a lot of his work has changed the most stubborn uh, and skeptical mindsets around conservation, where conservation was not something they thought was important to people now believing that conservation is something that they should care about, and even taking small steps to uh, help the planet and go out and enjoy nature more than they would have otherwise. And now there's me. <laughs> um, so my impact really started, uh, for the most part, has been about engaging the next generation. Uh, I want to give you a little bit background. Um, but before I do, I think David Attenborough said it best when he said, if children don't grow up knowing about nature and appreciating it, they are not going to understand it. And if they don't understand it, they're not going to protect it. And if they don't protect it, who will? And unfortunately, I think this is where we are. We are really needing a new generation of my, uh, conservation-minded people. And so I started my career, as you heard from Steve, it's been very windy, uh, when I was pregnant with my son. And he, my husband and I are both very passionate about wildlife, uh, animals in general, and of course, the environment. And so we wanted our son to grow up with that, that same value system. And so I created his nursery art with some species that we loved. And when he was born, I just was so, so taken with the fact that he loved the art and woke up every day smiling and uh, full of joy and pointing at the animals. And it inspired me to want to do this with other children and create more artwork that other children could enjoy and potentially fall in love with wildlife as well. And so over time, uh, I started painting more and more species. And what I quickly came to find was that every species had a challenge. It didn't matter if they were domesticated or otherwise. It, they could have been poached. They could have been trafficked. They could have been um, exploited. They could have had their habitat taken away from them. Or they could have just been endangered because of climate change. And regardless of the species, I saw that there was a need for something to be done. And so I felt this huge responsibility to give back. And so from the very beginning, I decided I was going to give back to this uh, specific issue. Um, Oh boy, I'm forgetting what I have here. <laughs> OK, I'll just click it. What happened? I, oh, I hit the power button. That's why. OK, but be, beyond giving back, I also do have been able to uh, connect with uh, organizations and so forth where I'm able to do work that's beyond giving back. And so in this case, Center for Biological Diversity used my artwork of different endangered species that they protect or work to protect um, on their major donor cards. I also let people, uh, let organizations use my art for fundraisers or for marketing. Uh, another way I've worked uh, is through working directly with an organization to create artwork that exemplifies the species that they're working with. So St. Francis Wolf Sanctuary out of Texas uh, takes in wolves and wolf dogs who cannot be reintroduced into the wild. And uh, they ask that I paint four of their most beloved species, or, or beloved wolf dogs, so that they could um, sell prints in their gift shop to raise money for the sanctuary. And I'm going to be honest, I had a boyfriend long distance for quite a while. <laughs> I fell quite in love with Achilles here. So uh, another way I like to get involved is through volunteerism. Uh, Stand for Animals clearly is a domesticated animal uh, clinic, veterinary clinic. But uh, 
what I love is that they're, they use, my, use me and my role uh, to help them come up with creative solutions to either engage the community or uh, raise money. And some of the things that we've done that have been a lot of fun is art shows, so getting artists sort of like, sort of like David Shepard Wildlife Foundation, but on a very tiny scale in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, getting donations from artists so that we could raise money for the clinic. And also, uh, for the last few years, we've had an annual dog talent show called So You Think You Can Bark. So th that's been a lot of fun as well. Another way that I engage uh, people and the next generation is through publications. Uh, my husband, who's also a Cornell grad, uh, he and I wrote our first children's book called I Wish For You, and all of the art and the, the, the wording is about how we can learn our val values that we hope our kids grow up with by observing wildlife. And um, we decided that we wanted this to be an educational tool right from the beginning, and so we provided back matter, which you can see here, that really discusses each species in more detail, and even we have a, a whole blurb about how you, biodiversity is very important and conservation also is important. And we hope to have our second book come out at the end of the year, and it will also be in the same vein. And as Steve mentioned, I most recently uh, was brought in by Artists for Conservation uh, as a member. And I work, uh, what's great about Artists for Conservation is on their platform, they have the ability to pair artists with the, who are doing this kind of work with the people who are interested in that kind of art and who are interested in conservation and want to purchase from artists in conservation. And I can tell you personally, that people buy my art for their nurseries or otherwise because they know I give back. And so that is a very powerful way to help people get engaged about conservation. This piece was done for Owasso Lions, which is a conservation group out of Kenya. And I painted um, Nanai, which was a beloved matriarch lioness in the pride that they protected. Uh, they unfortunately lost her. Uh, so this was sort of a memorial painting, but we um, sold the original, and now you can go to Artists for Conservation and purchase prints of this as well. And then I also work from with photographers like John Hyde. I've actually used his photography for some of my artwork, but in this case, uh, this was from my own photograph, observing herons building their own nest uh, for their for their little ones to be, I guess. And it was really just amazing to watch how human they were, where they were building nests, uh, and the, the dad would go out and get a branch and bring it back to the mom, and she would place it, and he'd go back out. It was just very inspiring to watch, and it was about a half hour that I watched them for. And so in this case, when I do a piece that's not necessarily tied to an endangered species, like the heron, uh, I will I will specify that I want um, money to go to something like Center for Biological Diversity so that it's, it's raising money for biodiversity or conservation as a whole. So what have my specific impacts been? Uh, I am really proud to say that as of 2023, I have been able to donate a total of over about $100,000 to wildlife conservation just through my art sales. Um, I also work to get into stores where they can use my art for uh, raising money, like parks, uh, National Park Service, San Diego Zoo. Uh, and of course, through my sales, I'm able to get the message of conservation across. In every package, there is something about how their purchase has made a difference. And so I've had over 40,000 sales in over 30 countries. So that, that conservation word is getting out there. Uh, also teaching the next generation, as I mentioned, uh, we've sold over 25,000 books so far from um, the first children's book. And what's that, what that has enabled us to do is to then go out and go to schools and talk about not only the book, but wildlife conservation as well. So as you can see, these are all very different examples of how artists are using their work to transform conservation. And um, it doesn't really matter what kind of art it is, but the point is that we want to move the needle through emotional uh, connection and uh, 
and to do so, we, we can use art in many different ways. I thought to end and wrap up the session, it would be really great to talk about how you potentially can use art in conservation and help move the needle. So for educators, it's really, it's really a mindset of how can we collaborate. So getting artists to understand conservation, maybe taking data classes or data and science classes where they learn how to translate the scientific data into their art and then use that art to hopefully instill that emotional connection and then evoke or inspire action. Uh, from the science perspective, a lot of conservationists don't think of artists as a, a, a place to go uh, for inspiration to either raise money or do any of their projects, but I think teaching them how, teaching scientists and conservationists how to communicate through art and how to leverage art to communicate to a broader audience is really helpful. And then for uh, conservation uh, opportunities for artists, having externships or artists in residence opportunities where artists can go into the field alongside conservationists and do documentation and painting just like David Shepard did um, is really a great opportunity. Um, for scientists and conservationists, if you're interested in using art in some form or fashion, thinking about what your goal is is really important. So do you want to drive awareness about what you do or a challenge that you're facing or just inform people about the specific uh, species that you're working with? And then how do you attach that to the human element? What is a story that you really want to tell? and then think about how art can play a role in that. Um, funding and staffing is a really big key to this. I can personally tell you when I've worked with conservation groups, they're small and scrappy, and it's hard for them to do much more than what they already do. So um, thinking about how much money it might take or if there should be somebody on staff who is really good at connecting with artists and working with them and helping to run that project. And finally, choosing wisely. If you're going to work with an artist, you want to make sure that their um, missions and values are in alignment with yours so that it's a, it's a well-executed project. And if you're an artist, um, obviously you should talk to other artists who are doing this. And if you can connect with conservation groups that you really um, admire or respect, uh, do so. Um, and really let your passion drive your work. So if you are passionate about polar bears or lions, paint them, sculpt them, create music around them, whatever it is that you do, and um, let that passion drive your work. Um, also, it's really important to consider, if you're still a student, to maybe taking courses in conservation so that you can start to learn about the issues that conservationists deal with and how you can potentially play a part. And of course, you want to learn how to communicate about your unique skill set because a lot of artists and a lot of conservationists do not think that they necessarily come together, but being able to communicate how you're going to add value is really important and obviously create as much as you can because that will help you move forward. And then finally, if you are just a person who loves wildlife, uh, I can tell you that you should look for artists who are creating and doing work in conservation and giving back to those causes. Um, oh, wow. I'm just like hopping around there. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, and then, you know, look for exhibits that focus on conservation work. Um, there are a lot of them out there. They, you do not have to go to London to see them. And um, if you're in a financial situation, you might even consider connecting with an organization that you're passionate about and offering to uh, fund a project that utilizes art. And of course, you want to share your interest with as many people as possible. Introduce friends and family to what you're passionate about so that they may, too, learn about the issues and have an, hopefully an open mind and a dialogue that can foster action. So there is a lot that I just talked about, so let's just do a quick recap. Uh, so we know that the way we've been communicating, for the most part, has not been the most effective in engaging a broader audience, and so we really need to try to be more effective in that. 
Uh, and to do so, we need to find a way to create an emotional connection to the issues and help people understand the value of conservation. Finally, of course, art has a unique power to do this because it is a much more effective approach in communicating the issues than science and data, and much more powerful. And then finally, anyone can be part of this movement in moving the needle. So with that, I would love to open it up to questions. And thank you. We want to put the lights on. I don't know if the, these, I think they are going to both work, so that's good. I think so. So what we'll do, um, we're going to start with questions in the room, and then we're trying to get the chat to uh, send questions. And so I will be repeating the questions, so make sure everybody can hear them. Um, yes. Yeah. And my other question is, what is the range that the original art sells for, at the prints, and how? What percentage do artists get for? Right. Um, for sure. Um, so Let me just re repeat the yeah. question. I think I'm going to actually go around with the mic because that was a long question. So the question is about art sales and what kind of prices you get for originals and how does the art the artist divide those proceedings and then how do you publish do you self-publish do you have a company that represents you so i'll start with the first question which was about the publishing so my husband and i so i'm actually a wellness author <laughs> so i've had a lot of experience with publishing and i've done both self-publishing i've been published by chronicle books as well as amazon publishing and we just decided, because of the platform I had, I could, we could just do it ourselves. And we did self-publish at the beginning, but it was really successful. And so, of course, I'm a maximizer. And I felt the need to like, see what else they could do uh, besides what I could do. And so we were picked up by Macmillan Publishing. And so the one that you saw was uh, the second sort of edition of the book. And it was published by their Roaring Brook press uh, imprint. And we learned, again, a lot from that process. It's always a learning process with publishing. So we are in the process of deci we've decided we are going to self-publish the next one. Um, and there are a variety of reasons that I, I mean, this could be a full hour conversation. Um, but in short, I just think that our platform is big enough that we are selling a tremendous number of the books that are being sold. So that's why. Uh, the second question about how much prints go for versus originals, it really is dependent on each artist um, and the size of work that you do. Uh, Nanai is a good example of uh, a, tr a typical piece that was about 16 by 20. Um, it was run on an auction, and so the auction, it, it, this is a challenge with conservation groups. They did not help market it as well as I think it could have been marketed. So we got a $500 bid. I was hoping for more, but it was, it was still a nice bid. Um, but if I were to sell that on the open market, I probably would have tried to hit about 1,000 on that. For prints, um, because I started in the nursery market, my prints, a five by seven is as cheap as $22. Uh, and I, I I'm very picky about the paper I use, and so a lot of people think it's actually original because of how beautiful the reproduction is. But I also print all the way up to 30 by 40, which off the top of my head, uh, just a paper print is in like the $140 range. But there's canvases I sell of the art and so forth as well. And this is just me. Um, clearly, there are, there are conservation. So some of the work that you saw with David Shepard, those pieces can go for thousands of dollars. And uh, because I've been on the, like, the youth sector, I've not priced that way yet. We're moving there. Maybe. Oh, and percentage you asked about, too, how much goes towards conservation. And that, too, can really depend on the, the artist. Um, I say I give a minimum of 10%, uh, but I often end up, at the end of the year, tallying it up, and it's more. Um, but I've seen, like, for specific campaigns, like the Nanai campaign, uh, 
she, I think the, the organization got like 350 or something out of the 500. Thanks, Brett. We've got quite a few things coming in online, so I'm going to just go back and forth. So well, we just have a comment first that uh, I just wanted to say that the polar bears from Ice Flow's concept and execution is brilliant and should be very effective. Oh. Well done. Well, I'll keep working on it. And it wasn't here's, a, here's a question from uh, a fellow uh, alum from the architecture school oh. saying that your Marlene says your artwork is exquisite. And her question is, was wildlife conservation something you found after your son was born, or had you always been interested in it prior to attending college? That's a great question. Um, you know, we don't know what we don't know. You know, and so I, I loved animals, and that's why I decided to do the nursery art uh, with animals. Uh, but it was only through my research that I learned that all the animals I love have something that they're battling. And so that's when I became aware of this situation, and that's when I started becoming more active. Um, had I known years ago that these, these were the issues, I probably would have been much more interested in it then. Uh, question in the back, yes. So he was a naive of generative artificial intelligence and the more people can just type in a few prompts and then generate artwork. What about for both for So the question is about how AI may impact the role of artists in the types of things we've been discussing. Yeah, and I will tell you, I have a small consortium of artists that we literally are are like are, are like a little peer support system, and we talk about this. And re really, we believe that AI has a place, but there's always going to be a person who wants real art from a real person, and the value of that can't be replaced. So yes, it's a challenge from an artist's perspective, and it's very frustrating, um, but in the end, at least in my lifetime, I'm really hopeful that people will continue to want man-made, human-touched art. So I'm going to switch to online. Two quick things. One uh, asks, does Brett present to veterinary students? It really would be wonderful. One Health. Rosemary, we've got veterinary students in the room and online. We are at the Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine. We totally agree with you. That's why we're so glad to have Brett here, because art is another way to change hearts and minds. Um, I have a question from a, what advice would you give to a humanities PhD students who want to incorporate themes of environmentalism and species conservation into their work? Uh, do you have uh, thoughts on bridging the academic and nonprofit sectors? Kind of a... Yeah, I mean, so I didn't really talk about the written word because I, I'm talking about how our senses really are, need to be um, I guess, tapped into to get that emotional response. But there's no denying that storytelling has a place. And with humanities, uh, understanding, for instance, there's no doubt in my mind that Sea Legacy, for all of the work that they do, they have copywriters, right? They have people who understand how to use word to evoke emotion. And then they pair it with these visuals and then they pair it with music, right? And so you're getting a whole, a whole experience, it's an experience when you watch their videos. So I, I mean, I, I can't, I don't, I am not a humanities person, but I would imagine that, you know, understanding sort of the bigger picture and how to sort of bring together multifacets is really important. Uh, and I would think that storytelling and understanding how to, to use words in a, in a good, motivating way that does not inflame, but instead of inclu is inclusive would be great. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, it how really... How did you start, sorry, how did you start in transitioning from just, not just being an artist, being an artist, but being an artist who donates some of your, your right. proceeds? So, um, so I started just giving here and there, 
And I, I realized that was not a very effective way to track how much I was giving. Um, I started doing the monthly donations where I knew I was giving, I don't know, at the early stages, $10 every month to Center for Biological Diversity. Um, but my profession is highly volatile. Uh, COVID proved to be an extremely successful time. Uh, but, you know, now people are not spending as much money on their home offices or, you know, their homes in general. And so, you know, we've seen a bit of a dip, a decline. Uh, and as a result, I've learned that really understanding the full picture of the year is really helpful. And then I give a big chunk. I'd rather give sort of a big chunk of money to an organization uh, at a time. And I can see, you know, my when I'm doing my taxes and so forth, where I landed so that I know that I'm giving a minimum of the 10%. Now, I will say, um, and I don't know that you asked this, but since you, you said you're an artist and you're starting and trying to figure it out, um, I started on Etsy. And Etsy has changed dramatically over the last uh, four years. When I think it was 2019, they had about 4 million stores, and now they have over, almost 8 million. And so trying to compete on that, that I, I would not encourage that as your venue. Um, but it, it served a time and place. Uh, it, it's a, a great role in time and place. So um, I think you know if you're starting out, definitely try to get a website. Try to understand sort of your niche, if you will. And um, there's nothing wrong with going on Etsy because it does give you a feedback loop. But I wouldn't be discouraged with if, if you're not seeing a lot of sales there. Great. We have time for one or two more questions between in the room and online. Anyone else in the room? All right. Online, uh, in your years of experience, have you come across any architect's work that has to do with conservation that you find inspiring? And what advice would you give to architects or architecture students who are passionate about these topics? That's great. Um, you know, my mom and her husband were docents at the Nashville Zoo for years, and they got kind of close to the architect who does a lot of the work um, on their campus, if you will. And I would say, and I, I will be honest, I, I'm not a huge zoo person. Uh, I know that they, they definitely have a place and a purpose, and I understand that, so I, I support them, but I would much rather, obviously, see everything wild and free. Um, but if you're interested in conservation, I mean, zoos do a lot of great work, and uh, maybe going to zoos and trying to connect with architects who are working on projects at zoos gives you the ability to understand habitat and uh, enrichment and all the things that go into conservation issues, at least from that perspective. Um, I also think talking to conservationists who are doing things like David Shepard, where they're building facilities to educate people around the world about conservation, that's an opportunity as well to see where you can kind of slot in where there's a need. Right on time. <laughs> can, we, can we thank Brett again for a, a just extraordinary presentation? Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much, Brett. And it was really great to see a lot of the organizations that you work with, we also work with, uh, providing you know, some of the wildlife health expertise. And I will admit, we do, if you go to wildlife.cornell.edu, we also have our own YouTube channel, but it's, we can't compete with Sea Legacy. Yeah, Sea so, well, Legacy is a... Yeah, we're doing it right now with handheld iPhones in, in the yeah. field, but... Maybe, so maybe you need to hire some videographers. Well, we've been thinking about it, okay. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. And uh, stay on our mailing list for future events. Have a good evening. <laughs>